Good morning, Waypoint Church. Good morning. Good morning. It's so good to be with you all this morning. Uh, I just wanted to come in sharing. Um, so fresh, fresh off of coming back from the, our youth mission trip. So our youth uh, spent this past week in, in Clarkston, Georgia, uh, just getting to serve alongside a, a ministry called Envision Atlanta, uh, doing a lot of work with, with refugees in, in the community. Uh, and and what, a, what an amazing time it was. Uh, I just want to, to reiterate uh, what, I, what I already knew um, from experience I can share with you that our youth are amazing. They are an incredible group of, of students who, uh, who are continuing to, to learn and grow. And, and uh, I think one of the things that they were particularly challenged with this week, just from, from like a, a practical standpoint, was uh, praying out loud. They're, they're constantly being challenged to, to pray in a group setting with, with each other to, to, and to, to learn what it means to rely on the Lord to work. Um, and so it's just a, just an amazing time. I wanted to share uh, one quick story from what we got to hear from what Envision Atlanta is, is trying to do in the future. Uh, Envision uh, has a has a farm that's just outside of, of Clarkston, um, and so as as they are engaging with uh, with different refugee communities in in the area, uh, they are telling this story in particular about how they are trying to engage with uh, some of their Somalian neighbors. Uh, and, and some of the Somalian neighbors had a, had a I believe it was a, a coffee shop, and so they tried to go uh, to the coffee shop just to just to try to make connections, try to trying to to form relationships with them, uh, and and it actually didn't go well for them. Um, they actually were uh, it was very very clear that they weren't welcomed uh, weren't welcome there. And so uh, what what they ended up finding out uh, there, there was a, another believer in in the area who who had this dream that. Uh, they would acquire camels, um, which is an interesting thing for, for them to desire, to, to look for camels. Uh, but what, what they found is that uh, the, the reason why he, he thought that this would be a compelling uh, thing for them to do is, is uh, camel's milk is actually a felt need for their Somali neighbors, that they actually, uh, they, they have actually felt like they are, not, they are doing a disservice to their kids. They, they drink camel's milk like we drink cow's milk, and they don't have access to camel's milk. They are saying that the, the only place in the, in the U.S. where they can get camel's milk is from Colorado, and it's actually really expensive to transport that to Georgia. Uh, I know our Coloradans in the room are like, yeah, look at us. Um, that's fine. Um, but they can't, they are saying it's about $22 for a gallon of camel's milk. It's really expensive. So it's really, really hard. It's, it's not, not very economical to do that. Um, and so they thought, okay, well, let's, this is a felt need for, for this community. So let's see, let's see if it's actually, if we're actually right on here. Let's see if this is actually something that, that uh, is, is desired. So they, they bought some camel's milk and they started going around in the community and just offering it, offering samples of camel's milk to see if this is something that they would want. And so they went to the different apartment communities that they're partnering with, uh, and uh, they were saying that the, this one man was, uh, the, the guy who had this, this dream uh, was kind of positioned in the community to just see as, as people are going door to door, uh, said, Let, let's, not, uh, let's not share the gospel as we go this time. Let's just, let's just see if this is a, an actual need that, that, that they want. Um, and so uh, they are sharing the story of this one man's, this guy, he's watching from a distance. He sees this, this one man's reaction. He's just very, his, his arms are just like he's, and, and so the, the, the man who's watching him, he, he got a little nervous. He thought, what, what, what's going on here? It's, it seems like there's a negative reaction to the camel's milk. So he, he walks over and, and uh, walks down from where he's at, goes over to, uh, to the door that this, uh, this person's giving camel's milk to, and he says, this, this is the greatest gift I've ever been given. I, I, where did you find this? And they said, well, it's not the greatest gift we've ever been given. So they, it, Jesus is the greatest gift you've ever been given. And th th this isn't very common in, in these communities, but th this man actually came, they say he came to faith that day. Uh, and so they, the Envision is, is working on uh, getting, acquiring camels to have sustainable camels on their farm. Uh, and so they're in this two-year process. They want to get it FDA approved so that they can start selling camel's milk into these communities um, to make it more affordable, more accessible. 
but the, but they're they're doing it because they want to make the gospel accessible to their to their neighbors. And so I just wanted wanted to share that it's just just a powerful example of of just people using their their giftings, their resources, uh, research, their, their, to engage. They they genuinely want to engage uh, people from all over the world with the, the truth of the gospel. And so they're thinking of creative ways to do that, like something like camel's milk. Um, and so uh, what, what, a, what a beautiful vision, what a beautiful picture of just giving, providing felt needs, how the, how the, the gospel can, can work even, even through that. And what, what can the church do that, that you, even, you even are a part of that by virtue of being a part of the global church, the, the larger church? That this, is, the, this is what it looks like to be the hands and feet. God is doing this in our midst, and people are partnering to make this possible. And, and so God is, is all over the place. And he is here with us this morning. And so I want, us to, I want to invite us into that this morning. That, that we are seeking and serving and, and worshiping the same God who's providing camels in Georgia is working in our midst here. And we need to ask ourselves, what, what is he calling us to do? And so I want to invite us into that spirit as we pray. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the work that you have done in our lives to secure our salvation. God, that we, we no longer are, are like orphans wandering around trying to figure out who we are or what we are about or how we can be right. But we know that our identity is found in you and in you alone. God, you have changed us by the power of Jesus on the cross who has saved us. And so, God, it's in that power that we place our identity. It's in that strength that we want to walk in that morning. It's in Jesus, Lord, that we want to, you are the alone, you alone, we want to worship and praise. We want to celebrate you in spirit and truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All the time. All the time. God is good. But guess what? Each and every one of you have just become honorary choir members. <laughs> praise the Lord. Welcome to the choir. Woo. Come on, y'all. We're going to show y'all how we praise him. Let's sing. Clap your hands. Come on.
smiles. Look at all these smiles. Praise God. God is so good. Ooh, I love to see God's people just smiling and worshiping together. Come on up here. Yeah, yeah. Ain't this your time to Oh, it's me. That's what it is. I just smiled. Didn't I? Okay, y'all. Praise God. All right, it's me. All right. Whenever you're ready, Sharon. I'm out of breath. Thanks, man. <laughs>
Amen. At this time in our worship service, we're going to come together for congregational prayer. And this is a time for us to pray as a congregation. Sometimes we pray for things going on in the community. Sometimes we pray for things going on in our country or our state or things going on in the world. Uh, sometimes we pray for our local church. And this morning we have a special prayer. Uh, we want to pray for uh, Pastor Jim and Sylvia Greenlee as they move just down the road to Burlington. Uh, they are faithful members of Waypoint Church. He is our pastor emeritus. Um, five years ago, Waypoint merged with Journey Church at South Point, and we brought two congregations together. And we are so grateful for these five years that we had you guys here in Durham Chapel Hill. And we know that God's called you to this new home just down the road. And we know we'll see you again. This isn't the final goodbye, but you know, you're going to be probably worshiping in a, in a community very close to your home because we know you love to invite people and you're, you're going you're gonna to find a new community there. Uh, but before you go, we want to pray for you. And like we send everyone off, we want to send you guys as ambassadors of Christ to the next place. And uh, so if, if Jim and Sylvia could come up. And I also want to invite uh, Pastor Jason Hughes and his wife Amanda. They are visiting. They were the former... He, Jason was the former pastor of Journey Church before we merged, and he is a pastor in somewhere else in, in Charlotte area. So we are. So he's going to be with us for this prayer, and uh, you guys can just stand right here. And we just want to pray for you, lay hands on you, and thank God for you. So, <sighs> Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for Jim and Sylvia for the blessing that they've been to so many people in the Durham Chapel Hill community for the past 30 years. God, you called them here. You called them here for ROTC and, and military uh, service. And then you called him to be a pastor, to be someone who proclaims the good news to the people here and, and, and creates gospel community. And you brought him and Sylvia to Farrington Road Baptist Church many years ago. And we thank you for the faithful witness and, and the, so many people and the lives that they were changed, people who came to know you and, and, the, and the gospel community that they were able to create. We thank you for, since the merger five years ago with Waypoint and the prayer ministry that they've led and the, that they go through each member and pray for each person at Waypoint Church personally. We thank you for their leadership we thank you for their hearts for the good news. We thank you for their hearts for people, that they live out the great commandment to love God and love others. God, as we send them just down the road to Burlington as they move into this retirement community, God, I pray that you go before them and just bless them and keep them and pour your favor upon them. And we just thank you that they're going to be faithful in this life, and then when you call them home, we're they're going to be faithful again. And until you come back, God, we just look forward to that day. But we know that you call us as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we thank you for their faithfulness. And we just give you all the praise for them. And we all the glory. And we just ask this and, and just go before them, God. Fill them with your spirit as they trust you in this next step. And we just thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks, y'all. And we will have a luncheon. For those of you guys who knew Pastor Jim and Sylvia, the luncheon will be in the fellowship hall about 15 minutes. Give us a little chance to set it up after the worship service. Everybody's invited to stop by and, and thank them and, and say hey to them and, and grab some lunch with them. So thanks, y'all. And now hear the word of God from Paul's letter to the church in Galatia, starting with chapter 4, verse 19. Oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again, and they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. I wish I were with you right now so I could change my tone, but at this distance, I don't know how else to help you. Tell me, you who want to live under the law, 
Do you know what the law actually says? The scriptures say that Abraham had two sons, one from his slave wife and one from his freeborn wife. The son of the slave wife was born in, human, in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. But the son of the freeborn wife was born as God's own fulfillment of his promise. These two women serve as an illustration of God's two covenants. The first woman, Hagar, represents Mount Sinai, where people received the law that enslaved them. And now Jerusalem is just like Mount Sinai in Arabia, because she and her children live in slavery to the law. But the other woman, Sarah, represents the heavenly Jerusalem. She is the free woman, and she is our mother. As Isaiah said, Rejoice, O childless woman. You have never given birth. Break into a joyful shout, you who have never been in labor. For the desolate woman now has more children than the woman who lives with her husband. And you, dear brothers and sisters, are children of the promise, just like Isaac. But you are now being persecuted by those who want you to keep the law, just as Ishmael, the child born by human effort, persecuted Isaac, the child born by the power of the Spirit. But what do the scriptures say about that? Get rid of the slave and her son, for the son of the slave woman will not share the inheritance with the free woman's son. So, dear brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman. We are children of the free woman. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If you're counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. I'll say it again. If you are trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses. For if you're trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you've been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. But we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive by faith the righteousness God has promised to us. For when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. You were running the race so well. Who held you back from following the truth? It certainly isn't God, for he is the one who called you to freedom. This false teaching is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. I'm trusting the Lord to keep you from believing false teachings. God will judge that person, whoever he is, who has been confusing you. Dear brothers and sisters, if I were still preaching that you must be circumcised, as some say I do, why am I being persecuted? If I were no longer preaching salvation through the cross of Christ, no one would be offended. I just wish that those troublemakers who want to mutilate you by circumcision would mutilate themselves. For you've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Erica. Um, I'm Danny, one of the pastors here at Waypoint, and I'm delighted, and it's a pleasure to preach God's Word to you this morning. Uh, for those of you who are new to Waypoint, we just read a really long passage with a lot of uh, detailed information, including some harsh words from Paul. Um, some of you may be like, I have no idea what we just read. Uh, some of you may not be used to the New Living Translation, which translates uh, the Greek and Hebrew idioms into modern English so that you can hear it. As we hear it, it's, it's trying to be as close to how the original hearers would have heard it. Uh, we're in a sermon series, and we're looking at one of Paul's letters in Galatians, uh, and we go back and forth here at Waypoint between the Old Testament and the New Testament. We were trying to preach through the whole Bible in 10 years, and we are at Galatians, and we are at this chapter this week. So uh, it's a tough one. It's not exactly... You know, it's, it covers a lot of material, and it's Paul continuing to bring up a lot of the same points that he brought up over and over again. 
But I want to start off with a story that might help us set the tone for what's going on here. So this is kind of a funny story, uh, so bear with me. But when I, I lived overseas, I was an international student in China, a foreign exchange student, or not exchange student, just an international student. And there was a bunch of students from all over the world that were in my program. And when we would hang out, like on Friday or Saturday nights in the dorm, we would all be sitting around. And we generally would talk in English, because that was the common, even though we were supposed to be learning Chinese, most of us didn't have good enough Chinese to actually converse. We were all more at the beginning level. But we would be talking in English, just kind of shooting the breeze, talking to each other. And all of a sudden, we're talking about one of our teachers. And she's really harsh. And she, we, had to do, we had a character class where we had to draw the Chinese character, I mean, write them and memorize them. And this was the harshest teacher we had. And we're all talking about her and making jokes. And everybody's talking about her. And then one of the other Americans, a friend of mine, is like, yeah, she's the character Nazi. So if any of you have ever watched Seinfeld, uh, there's a famous skit in Seinfeld, the soup Nazi. And the soup Nazi is someone who will, Jerry Seinfeld names him that, Jerry Seinfeld who is Jewish, but he, he names him the soup Nazi, so it's this funny skit. Well, when my friend said she's the character Nazi, right next to him is a girl who grew up in East Germany, communist East Germany. And she looks over and says, what did you say? What did, like... She was shocked. She's, she had no context for what my friend said, this American. And in his mind, he's just saying a joke that exists in our culture that we got, the other Americans there got. We thought it was funny, actually, that he's equating her style to this skit in a, in a TV show. And this German student, it took my friend about 20 minutes of backpedaling <laughs> and explaining and this is before the internet was fast. This is when we used to have the dial-up thing where you dial and it go beep, you know, and all that. So it wasn't like he could just hop on YouTube and show her the skit. You know, this is when, before videos were prominent on the uh, internet. I'm kind of aging myself. So my friend had to explain to her what he was talking about because she was very offended by this statement. And as he explained it to her, she thought it was funny and it, everything was fine. And I think sometimes when we read the Bible as modern American people, we're very offended by something a lot of times, or we're missing things, just like this German girl missed what my friend said. She didn't understand the context. She knows what the word Nazi means. And she, all she knew was all she could go on is the information she had. So a lot of times when we come to the text, we're taught, you know, come to the text, the Holy Spirit, you know, God will teach you through the text, and he will. But we also need context. We also need to understand the Greco-Roman world that the text was, the, was written in. We need to understand the, the background, what, what, what it was like in Galatia, what these people were going through. And what, and what is Paul trying to tell them? So I want to give you guys the context and try to jump in and say, what's going on in this passage? And what does this mean for us today as followers of Christ? So there's three things I want to do today. First one, I want to cover... And we can put these up. Why does Paul use this analogy about the two women and their children from the Old Testament? And what did it mean to the original audience? The second thing I want to look at is why is Paul still talking about circumcision? He's been talking about it the whole time. Like, can he get over it? And why is he so angry? He literally says, cut yourself off. Erica doesn't like when I do uh, hand motions, but I'm Italian, I guess. I got to do it, you know. So it's kind of gross. But he literally says, emasculate yourselves or... You know, that's, that's what the text says. The, the New Living tries to water it down a little bit, but he, he says, castrate yourself. Okay, why is he so angry, and what does he mean here? And then the last one, what does this mean for us today as followers of Jesus? So we just read a long section in Galatians. All right, so why does Paul use this analogy about the two women and their children from the Old Testament, and what did it mean to the original audience? So I'm going to read the first part of what Erica read, and then we'll, we'll, we'll look at it. All right, oh, my dear children... I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again, and they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. I wish I were there with you right now so I could change my tone, but at this distance, I don't know how else to help you. And the analogy that Lawrence used and a lot of commentators use is Paul is like their parent. Paul says, I birthed you. So he's saying, I'm like your mom. I birthed you. I'd use hand gestures again, sorry. I'm, I just... You know, he, that's the image he wants you to have. So I'm being Pauline. I'm being like Paul. 
You know, he wants to show, even though he's a male, he's trying to show the imagery that he birthed the church. And that comes in later. Paul's using a lot of wordplay here. So he's saying, I birth you. I, Paul planted these churches, and all the Greco-Roman people in the church were not Christians before God, Paul got there. He's the one, him and his companions are the one who told them the gospel. Now these other people who are Jewish background Christians are saying, now you got to become Jewish, culturally and religiously Jewish, to be a good Christian, to be a right Christian. And Paul is so frustrated because he's like, that's not the gospel. So that's why Paul is doing this. And then he goes on in verse 21. He says, tell me, you who want to live under the law, do you know what the law actually says? The scriptures say, and by law, we can keep the thing up, but I'm going to explain the law, they would refer to as Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books of what we call the Old Testament. So in the law, in Genesis, is the story about Abraham. And it says, the scriptures say that Abraham had two sons, one from his slave wife and one from his freeborn wife. The son of the slave wife was born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. But the son of the freeborn wife was born as God's own fulfillment of his promise. And if you want to go back and you can read this story in Genesis, it's the story of Hagar and Sarah. God promises that Abraham would have descendants through his wife, Sarah, who at this point is past menopause. She can't have children. And, Abraham, and they, they laugh. They're like, this is impossible, God. It can't be true. So Sarah and Abraham say, well, and it's a tradition in our custom, in our culture. If the woman can't have a baby, that the husband has a baby with one of the people in the community, uh, a servant girl or something, and that's what they do. They don't trust God and his promises. They take matters into their own hands. It's kind of the story of humanity, right? It was the story of the, those people, and it's the story of us. We're like, thanks, God, for the promise. Now I'll take matters into my own hand. So what is Paul doing by bringing up this story? Paul actually says that this is an analogy. It's the only time in Paul's writing where he specifically says, I'm giving you an analogy or an allegory, or an illustration. So we can't say that Paul's... So, so the best way I could come up with this, I thought about this, is to use an analogy in our modern situation to kind of maybe show you what Paul's doing. But before I do that, I want to address the, the, the word slavery here. Um, as we say, we've said multiple times at Waypoint when we've preached in Ephesians and Colossians and other places... Um, Paul is not endorsing the slavery that happened in, Amer in the Americas here. It, th this is very, very different. This is a bond servanthood that existed in their culture, and Paul's using the examples from their culture. So uh, when you hear that word, it sounds harsh to us, just like my friend's example of the, the, uh, the character Nazi, soup Nazi example. But if you really put it in, a re in its original context, you, Paul's just using an illustration from their culture. Um, so just, just wanted to say that, and, and we do want to, at Waypoint, continue to acknowledge that if anybody wants to talk about this, or when you come to the text and something seems hard or doesn't seem right, we, come talk to us. We want to help you, show you what this means in the original context, and maybe how it's been abused in our modern context. So that's an aside. Now we're back to the main story. So what is Paul doing with this analogy? I thought of an analogy that might be a parallel. Paul is generally writing this section to the Judaizers. The Greco-Roman people who are in the church, who are hearing this, they would have no idea what Paul's talking about from this ancient story, because they didn't grow up with those stories. If you didn't grow up with stories, like I, my kids grew up with Auburn football, so they've got some stories. They know who Bo Jackson is. But if you didn't grow up in my household, or, or you may not know about Bo Jackson's legend at Auburn if you lived in another part of the world. So, they, so the Greco-Roman people probably wouldn't really know much about the story of Hagar and Sarah. They would just know generally about Abraham. But the Judaizers would know the story. So probably this section is written so that Paul can address the Judaizers. And I would say a good analogy for us, what Paul's doing here, it'd be the equivalent is if you had a, somebody my age, my, people my age, their grandfathers could have fought in World War II. So I have some friends whose grandfathers actually fought in World War II. My, my grandfathers worked in factories. They were considered vital in America, so they didn't actually go overseas. But people my age, our grandfathers served in World War II. Imagine if I had a friend, and he thought his grandfather was an American hero. 
in World War II. But then he finds out that his grandfather was actually a spy for the German army. He was a traitor. It would flip the whole narrative on its head, right? He lived his whole life thinking that his grandfather was a hero, and now someone comes and gives the news that actually your grandfather was a traitor. That's what Paul's doing here. He's flipping it. He's saying, you think you're, by, by making these Greco-Roman Christians follow the law of Moses, that you're actually in line with what the scriptures teach? You're, it's actually the exact opposite. You're not a child of the, you're not teaching the promise. You're teaching the opposite. Does that make sense? That's what he's doing. So I actually have three quotes from some uh, New Testament scholars that I'm going to put up. And the first one is from Ronald Y.K. Fung. And he talks about this prophecy as a double illustration. Actually, for time's sake, I'm just going to jump ahead. So, But just know that Paul, he's saying there's two things going on here. One is about Sarah and and the idea of that the one who was barren becomes the one who has the children. And he's kind of saying, like, you, you guys think you're Sarah, but actually you're acting like Hagar. You're, you're like the not promise. Go on to the next, the next quote. I'm going to jump ahead because this is kind of a long one. Okay, Moses Silva. So after the Hagar-Sarah quote, then, Mo, then Paul in this section quotes Isaiah 54. And this is from uh, New Testament scholar, scholar Moses Silva. He says... Since Isaiah 54.1 follows immediately upon the song of the suffering servant. You know in Isaiah, what we say is about Jesus, the suffering servant. It's often read at Good Friday. And this is no doubt alluded to earlier in Galatians. Paul evidently expected the Galatians to see the connection between faith in the crucified Christ and incorporation into the numerous peoples who have the new Jerusalem as their mother. So in this Isaiah, and then go to the next quote, and this is from um, Karen Jobes, another New Testament scholar, taking off the ideas of, of Silva. Indeed, it has been argued that in the book of Isaiah, the theme of Sarah's barrenness is transformed from a past story of a child to the future story of a birth of a people. This development made it exegetically possible for Paul to disassociate the Isaiah proclamation from ethnic Israel exclusively in other words, Sarah's children include those who truly search for God and his righteousness. So let me, let me sum up what she's saying there. What Paul's doing is he's saying, you guys missed it. The prophet Isaiah, the only other time in all of the Old Testament where Sarah is called by name, other than the Genesis account, is in this Isaiah prophecy. And she's called the mother of the nations, the mother of the promise. Sorry, I keep using the hand illustration, but that's, that's what Paul wants you to see. And now Paul's saying, I'm like a mother to you, and I, what I'm doing was promised by the prophet Isaiah about the suffering servant. So catch this, guys. Don't miss this. That's what Paul's doing in that section. So I know it's confusing, but I just wanted you guys to hear it and hear it as they would have heard it. All right, why is Paul still... Point two, why is Paul still talking about circumcision? Why is he so angry? What does he mean here? So Paul starts off what we would call chapter five. They didn't have chapters and verses in the original thing. It was just a letter that was read straight through. He says, so Christ has truly set us free. I could just end the sermon here. Just know you're free in Christ. Walk away, go home, and live in that reality. I don't have to say anything else. This is your reality. For all of those who have called upon the name of Jesus and put your faith in him, you are free. There's no other requirements. Zero. You are free in Christ. That's what Paul is trying to say. That's one of the main themes and thrusts of Galatians and the, whole, the gospel. If you put your faith in Christ, you are free. And then he says, now make sure you stay free. And don't get tied up again into slavery to the law. And this is why instead of calling Hagar the servant woman, he calls her slave because Paul's trying to use the imagery of slavery. And slavery is a very important concept to Jewish people because they were in slavery, they were in bondage in Egypt. And like the center point of the Old Testament story is the Exodus. 
kind of like we look to the cross, they look back to God's deliverance at the Exodus, the Passover into the, the Exodus into, into the Passover, the Passover into the Exodus. Jesus actually dies on the Passover, and Jesus, it, that's, that's a whole other story for another day as we look at the Gospels. But for them, the idea of slavery, why would you want to go back to the bondage? So that's why Paul continues to use this language. All right, start going on in verse 2. Listen, and probably in the original Greek, it's harsher than that. Come on, guys. You're about, to, if a parent sees their kid, Lawrence used this illustration, in the road about to get hit by a car, you say, hey, guys, come here. You scream. That's what Paul, Paul is screaming because they're going to get hit by a, a truck. Paul is screaming at his children, get out of the road. Come to safety. Come to the arms of Jesus. Listen, I, I, Paul, tell you this. If you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. He's been talking about this for like three chapters, y'all. He, they, he really wants him to get it. I say it again. If you're trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation of the whole law of Moses. For if you're trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. And that's the same word, cut off. I'll use the hand motion again. Paul's play, doing a lot of wordplay here. You have fallen away from God's grace. But we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait by faith the righteousness God has promised to us. Paul's introducing the idea of the Spirit. This is the second time in Galatians he's brought this up. The next section is about life in the Spirit. Paul's setting us up for that. But we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive the faith, by faith, the righteousness God has promised. So we received God's righteousness when we accepted Christ, but there's also this future grace that's coming when God makes all things new. And Paul's alluding to that here. In verse 6, For when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit from being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. And this is the crux, this is the fulcrum, this is the shift in Paul's letters, right here. What's important is faith expressing itself in love. And how can Paul say this? How can Paul say that faith expressing itself in love is more important than the law of Moses? He goes on, and he says, you were, I'll answer that question. I, I left you hanging, I'm going to answer that, because Jesus answered it. And Paul refers to Jesus a lot. The whole thing, this whole thing's about Jesus. And how Jesus is a fulfillment of all the Old Testament. You were running the race so well. Who has held you back from following the truth? It certainly isn't God, for he's the one who called you to freedom. So notice the terms that keep showing up. Faith, freedom, love. That's the title of the sermon. This false teaching is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. They all know what yeast is. Yeast is linked to the Passover. They know this idea, the Jewish people that are the, the false teachers. I'm trusting the Lord to keep you from be believing false teachings. God will judge that person, whoever he is, who has been confusing you. Dear brothers and sisters, if I were still preaching that you must be circumcised, as some say I do, why am I still being persecuted? If I were no longer preaching salvation through the cross of Christ, no one would be offended. I just wish those troublemakers who want to emasculate you by circumcision would mutilate, would want to mutilate you by circumcision, would mutilate themselves. It's kind of a gross analogy. It's the word for castration. If any of you worked on a farm or whatever, you have to castrate animals. Um, they would have known what this means and what Paul's saying, the harshness of it. Interesting thing, Paul's using a lot of wordplay. He starts this section off talking about birth, like I'm birthing you. And then he talks about castration, which leads to no birth, which leads to death. There can't be new life if there's castration. Just showing you what, what's going on here. There's a lot more than just, you know, what we might catch as American readers. 2,000 years removed from the original text. Paul says the cycle of life in the church must continue. Churches must birth other churches. The gospel goes out. That's what Jesus set, that's how Jesus set it up. All right, so I'm going to bring up two things that we often hear when we, when we, when we talk about Galatians. Um, 
The first one is when people hear Galatians, a lot of modern American Christians, because that's who I, you know, I'm with a lot, uh, we see Paul's trying to address personally trying to earn your salvation through doing good stuff for God. Like that, and that's from Luther. Luther struggled a lot personally, so when he read Galatians, it was so freeing for him. Actually, Galatians changed his life because he was trying to do that. And that is one of the things Paul is addressing in Galatians. So I don't want to downplay that. That is one of the things Paul's dealing with, that we don't earn it. So if you're that person who thinks maybe you're an overachiever, the triangle's filled with a bunch of high achievers. So if you're that person who thinks that you've got to keep earning your salvation by doing stuff for God, live in God's freedom. You're free. You, it's done. It's finished. Jesus died, and he rose again, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's coming back to make all things new. You are free in that. That's the good news. The Spirit has been poured out on us. You have the Spirit in you. You don't have to earn your salvation. Now, I, I get it because sanctification is doing stuff for God because we are saved. But don't live in this false reality. The second part of what Paul is addressing here is cultural or personal prejudices, preferences, and blind spots that we, we hold that hinder us from pointing people directly to Jesus. And we've talked about this in multiple sermons, so I'm just going to briefly go over it one last time because this is, Paul does actually bring up circumcision again at the end of the letter. But I want to talk about this one last time. I've brought it up. Lawrence has brought it up. Eric, Ben, all of us who've been preaching through Galatians keep going back to this. So I'm going to show the diagrams I showed in my previous uh, sermon. So this would be the goal, according to Paul. There's lost people. Faith, they get to Jesus. They don't need to go through the works of the law. That's what Paul's, that's in their context. Now, most of us don't worry about the works of the law. None of us think... We don't live in a Jewish context. We don't live in a context where our culture, our religion, and all of it is, is rolled into one. So we just think, you got to be a good Jewish person in all areas to get to Jesus. But that's, this is what Paul presents. Now, this is our goal. When we meet someone and we want to bring them to Jesus, we want to bring them from their culture to the kingdom culture. That's the goal. Directly. Do not pass go. You know, just go straight to the kingdom culture. But this is what we do because we're humans. We take them from their culture, through our culture, because we think our culture is the Jesus culture. Whether it's the literal culture that we live in or our personal preferences. Some, you, have you ever walked in a church and they're singing a song you don't like? And you're like, I don't like this song. I, these people may not be Christians. I, I mean, <laughs> I've done it and I'm a pastor. So we have these prejudices. There's grand scale prejudices like slavery and Jim Crow in America. Eric and I just spent a couple days for our anniversary in D.C. and went to a lot of the history museums. And you can see hundreds of examples just by walking through the American History Museum of ways where the church forced people into whatever the pro provident, prominent cultural ideas were of the time and made the Bible, tried to do whatever they could to make the Bible line up with these ideas. And slavery and Jim Crow are clear examples of that. They literally have Bibles where the slave owners cut verses out because they don't want the slaves to read them. The Jim Crow, I mean, this is so obvious in our own culture. I'm, I'm picking on my own culture because it's mine. But at the same time, that's, those are grand things, big scale things. But we also do this on smaller levels, on personal levels. Uh, my, one of my professors in seminary was from Korea, and he came to America to do his graduate work in seminary. And he went to the Bible study, so they, they lived in dorms at the seminary, and he went to the InterVarsity graduate Bible study. And it was in the lounge in the dorm. And when they went to do, they went to do the Bible study and the prayer, and he's from Korea, and this is like the 70s. So first of all, the guys had their Bibles on the floor. Then the guys, the Americans, when they went to pray, they kind of lounged in the couch when they prayed. And he was like, he, he tells the story, retells it. He walked away thinking none of these people are Christians because Christians treat the Bible with respect because that's what we do. Christians, when they pray, they do this. You have two feet together if you're sitting, and this is how you pray. Because in his culture, that's how they prayed. 
if you sit like, I don't know, like an American youth or a college student, <laughs> thank you, Jesus, for the, yo, God, you know, they're like, yo, God, thanks for this day. Is the yo, God, college student not a Christian? No. But in his culture, and he honestly said, I had to repent. I learned that these guys were great Christians. They became some of my best friends. I'm still in touch with them. But he had to tell us a story because and he was just like, these people can't be Christians because of their demeanor. And Paul's saying, don't do that. You're a Christian because you follow Christ, not because of personal preferences. Let's not put barriers on sharing the gospel with people. If you weren't here when we started the service, Pastor Eric shared a story about our youth group's mission trip to the refugee area in Atlanta last week. And he shared a story about camel's milk. If you didn't hear that story, I'm not going to retell the whole story this morning. Go back and listen to it. And then all I'm going to say today is if those missionaries in Atlanta, those people who are loving on the refugee communities, once the, the community that they were loving on is like, we don't, we don't want you, if they just walked away because of personal preferences or, well, we don't like them, they don't, you know, we don't, they don't, they're not going to do things our way, so we want nothing to do with them. Instead, they prayed and they asked God for wisdom, and God actually gave a believer a dream saying, try to meet them where they're at. Don't bring them through your culture and your stuff. Bring them from exactly where they are and point them to Jesus. And they felt called that camel milk, camel's milk is what's going to point them to Jesus. So what's camel's milk for you? And what are the things, you know, we, we have these blind spots. Every generation, the church, the academy, the secular academy, every group of people thinks right now we've got it 100% right and we've cleared all the blind spots of the past we've dealt with. The church does it and the academy, the secular academy. Does. Everyone thinks right now we're, we're at the point in history where we've solved all the problems and we're doing everything perfectly. But history would show that 50 years ago they thought that same thing. And 100 years ago, every generation, everyone else has blind spots. So we need to pray and ask God, how can we just point people to Christ and not have any barriers? And it's going to mean that people who don't smell like us, look like us, talk like us, act like us, or act like we want them to act, we're going to have to love them. So what does this mean for us today as followers of Jesus? This is a complicated passage packed with a lot of biblical and practical theology. So I'm, I'm not covering everything Paul's dealing with here, y'all. But here are some things we can glean from Paul's exhortation to these people that he loves. And he wants to see, get off the road, you're going to get hit by a car. Turn back to safety and freedom in Christ. He says this, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one commandment, one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. What's Paul talking about here? In the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we have accounts of religious teachers of the law trying to trick Jesus, trying to trap Jesus by asking him lots of questions. And one of the questions was, what's the greatest commandment? Let's look at Mark chapter 12. One, this is Jesus interacting with one of the teachers of the law. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of the commandments, which is the most important? And he thinks of the Ten Commandments, that Jesus is going to pick one, and then what he's going to do is when Jesus says, you know, the first command, then he's going to say, well, what about this other one? So he thinks he's going to trick Jesus. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment in these. When Matthew retells the account, which this could have happened multiple times, Matthew says that Jesus ends it with all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And then in the Luke account, there's another time where Jesus asked the teacher, uh, it says, one, on one account, an expert in the law stood to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
And Jesus says, what do you think? And he actually answers, love God, love your neighbor. Because he knows that that's what Jesus wants him to say. And I love this. But then Luke tells us, but he wanted to justify himself. And that's the same word justify that Paul uses, to make himself right with God. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? What does Jesus tell him? The story of the Good Samaritan. They hated Samaritans. They were the most despised of all the people. And Jesus says, this is what it means to love your neighbor. I'm not, there's a quote. I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to read the last section. Um, this is from N.T. Wright. It is faith that works through love. Love is open to all, no matter of what ethnic origin. But even more, love is precisely the motivating force through which God himself welcomes all believers into his family. That same motivating force is what ought to make all family members welcome one another as well. Faith working itself out in love. Right after this, Paul says the acts of the flesh. And he's using the same word flesh linked to circumcision. And he says, these are sins that will separate you from God. And we're going to look at that next week. And then right after that, he says, this is what the, the law is. How do you love your neighbor? And guess what Paul gives us there? The fruit of the Spirit. That's the essence of the law. The fruit of the Spirit. We're going to look at that next week. Let's take some time to pray right now. I wish I could go into more. There's so much more in this passage, but I want you to pray. First thing, this is personal prayer. What are some barriers you put on yourself that keep you from seeing your salvation in Christ alone? Maybe you're doing well in this area. Maybe you're struggling in this area. But pray, just take some moment of God and think, are there barriers that you put where you doubt that you are a child of God? And ask God and just... Say, God, I need your freedom. So take a moment to, to confess to God these barriers and, and live in his freedom and ask him to fill you with his Holy Spirit so that you are affirmed in freedom in Christ, that your salvation is secure in Christ. Father, we all have seasons of doubt. We all have seasons where we feel like we're not good enough or our sins are too great or we've let you down. God, I pray that we would know that our salvation is secure in you because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection to new life and the pouring out of the Spirit on believers, filling us and sealing us. So I pray that each person in here would know if you call upon the name of Jesus, your salvation is secure. And then we can go live for you and honor your commands. Thank you, Jesus. We accept your freedom. Amen. And now I want us to think, what are prejudices, preferences, our blind spots? Not in the nation. This is us. We're not, we're, we've, we've covered a lot of prayer for the nation. We'll continue to pray for our nation, for our people, for our world as, as a church. But right now, this is us. This is you. Don't look at others. Don't point the finger at others. What are prejudices, preferences, or blind spots that you have or that you feel that might keep you from pointing people directly to Christ? And just lay those at the feet of Jesus and ask God what you should do about it. How can you not be like that, not be like these people, forcing people to add, to, to get to Jesus, adding regulations and laws, that you could be the kind of person that lives a life where prejudices, preferences, and blind spots, you know, that God allows you to begin to, to move, remove those so you could point people directly to Christ. So just take a moment to confess, to talk to God, whatever you need to do right now.
God, I thank you for each person you brought here today. And all of us come with baggage. All of us come with these things. I pr- even the desire to not do these things become these things, we, we, or become a law or regulation that keeps us from following you, God. It, it's a cycle of sin, but we are free from bondage because of Jesus. And God, I pray that each person in here would, would recognize that you love the world, John 3.16. And when you saw the crowds, you had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And you called us to be your shepherds, to go love and care for the world and and point people to Christ. God, show us our ways as individuals of how we, we put barriers on helping people, pointing people to Christ and our own prejudices and preferences stand in the way. God, we're going to make mistakes with this. We're going to fail. When we do fail, help us to build each other up as brothers and sisters, to correct each other, to love each other, to be patient with each other, to be merciful with each other. But God, we trust this to you. May we be the church that you called us to be, that it lives in the freedom we have in Christ and, and lives in that freedom and goes out and loves other people, pointing them to the freedom that they can have in Christ. May, we, may that be us. We just trust this to you and ask that your spirit pours out upon us as your local church. And we thank you for the words in Galatians that we have freedom in Christ. May we live in that freedom. In Jesus' name, amen. It's okay. So in continuing prayer, I want you to know that um, there are people here for the prayer team that have yellow lanyards so that if you want someone to pray with or you want to extend your prayer that um, Pastor Danny started us with, you are more than welcome there here to pray with you. Or if you don't want to go to one of the individuals with the lanyards, maybe someone beside you, you can hold their hand and they will pray with you. Okay? And so we're going to move on with the um, with our worship. And we're going to ask, now we're going to ask Greg to come up and sing a selection for us. Praise God. Would you stand with us as we worship? Let's sing, this is my desire. This is my desire to honor
give you our heart, and we give you our souls. Lord, that is our desire, is to worship you with our heart and our soul. And Lord, if that's not our desire, I pray that you make that our desire. Change our hearts to want you, Lord. And let's continue to worship. Lord, I give you my heart. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul.
Praise the Lord. What a, what a wonderful... It's always good to be among His people and to praise His name. For He has done mighty things on our behalf. He is the author and perfecter of our faith, and He continues to work for us. Uh, at this time, I would like to continue our, our worship service by asking our welcome team to come forward to collect tithes and offerings. As they're doing that, I uh, just want to remind you that, that your tithes and offerings... Uh, one is, is a way for us to, to posture ourselves uh, to, to seek first the kingdom of God. The ways that we are doing that as, as a local church is a way for us to partner together. That even as, a, again, as I mentioned uh, this earlier in the service, going on the, the youth mission trip, your, your giving helps to, to offset some of the costs for, for things like that. Your giving uh, helps to offset uh, costs for, for ministries like uh, what, what our uh, local missions director, Joy McHale, is doing in Duke Manor, ministering to, to refugees there for, for some of our other partnerships, uh, being able to, to serve uh, international students in, in, uh, at the various campuses around in our community. So uh, we thank you for, for your, your generous partnership. And uh, as we seek to advance this gospel, as we seek to, to, to be partnering together to, to make known what Jesus has done for, for us and, and for the world. Um, and, and we want to start here in the triangle. Uh, a few announcements for us as, as they're coming around. First, family commissioning. Uh, family commissioning, this is an opportunity for us to, uh, to celebrate uh, the, the new life that, that God is bringing into our church through, through our children. Uh, it's also a way for us to, uh, as, a, as a church body, come together to, uh, to partner together alongside our parents. We want to create an environment where uh, our kids are being raised up to, to know the Lord and to follow Him and to learn His ways and to walk in them. And so, uh, Family Commissioning, we, we encourage you, if you, if you have a, a newborn uh, or if you, have a, if you haven't commissioned uh, your, your child yet, uh, I think two and under, uh, we'd love for you, even, even a little older if, if you need to, if, we'd love for you to be a part of this. Uh, contact Tony at waypointrd.com uh, by August 14th to participate. This is going to be on Sunday, August 28th during the worship service. Uh, next, we have our pre-service prayer. We want to, again, to remind you, we have pre-service prayer uh, every Sunday morning in room 167. That is uh, right over here in the corner of the building on this side of the side of the building. Uh, right beside, we have like our, our library there. If you've ever passed by those, uh, the, the shelves of books over there, that, that's for you. Uh, those are resources for you. You, t- you can uh, check those out. But the, in that room, we, we really want to encourage, uh, it's from 945 to 1015. We'd love for more people in the life of our church to be, uh, to be committed, to be devoted together uh, in praying, praying for the service, praying for our congregation, praying for uh, people who are going to be coming into these doors. Uh, we, we don't know where... What you've, what you've been through this, this past week, but uh, we, we know that God moves through prayer. And so we want to we be a church that postures ourselves in this way, who is actively seeking the Lord to do for us what we cannot even do for ourselves. And so uh, we believe that prayer is, a, is an important way of doing that. So we, you're, you are welcome to, to be a part of that. Uh, next, we have our new volunteer orientation for Waypoint Kids. So if you're a member and you'd like to, to learn more about Waypoint Kids and how, how you can serve in this ministry, how you can... This is, in particular, this is for training people to be involved in this ministry. Uh, before church service uh, on August 7th, so that's going to be next week, uh, we're going to have a, Tony's going to be hosting a, a training uh, so that you can get, we're looking for more people to, to get plugged into our, our growing Waypoint Kids ministry. Uh, as, as we have more people coming into their church, we have, uh, I, think, I think for every one person in our church right now, there's maybe 2.3 kids. So uh, the, the need is great. Uh, we'd love for you to be a, a part of this. this is not, not true, but it's probably close. Uh, um, so you can RSVP on the Realm, uh, you, or you can contact Tony at waypointarm.com directly. Uh, child care is provided. I'd love for you to, to get trained and, and join into that ministry, and she can tell you more about that. Uh, Next week, we have our, a member meeting. This is going to be a very, very brief member meeting coming up. It's going to be before the church service uh, on August 21st, so that's a few weeks, a few weeks out from here. Uh, it's going to be at 10 o'clock in the fellowship hall. Uh, and so this is going to be an opportunity for us to, to come together uh, to, to vote on our ongoing uh, affiliation with the SBC. You can uh, look at, at Realm to find out more information about some of, the, some of our conversations about that uh, we, we've had town, town hall meetings. Uh, if, if you'd like to, uh, if you weren't able to attend that and you'd like to, to, to tune into that, you can contact Danny at waypointr.com and uh, those were recorded. He can get you that information. Uh, again, that's going to be August 21st. Very short meeting uh, at 10 o'clock. Come, come on time because uh, we have, again, church service is still starting at 1030 that day. I know many of you think maybe the, the service starts at 1045. 
It doesn't. Um, so you might actually be early that Sunday. Uh, next, uh, and finally, we have our uh, Pastor Jim Greenlee, his, his luncheon. Uh, again, this is right after service today. Uh, and so we'd love for you to come. Give us, give us about 10 minutes, uh, maybe 15 minutes for, for them to get organized. But uh, the food, food's going to be served. Uh, lunch is provided over in the fellowship hall. And we'd love for you, at this point, you don't have to RSVP. It's kind of already happened. But uh, you can, w- there's grace. You can still show up. We'd love for you to, uh, just, just to honor. This is a time for us to honor Pastor Jim and Sylvia and, and the, their faithful ministry in the life of our church. We are so, so grateful, so thankful for you and all, all the things that you have done to get us to this point. Uh, and just uh, continue to, to pray for you and your family. We just, well, let, let's honor and, and, and bless them as they have been a blessing to us. Um, Waypoint Church, as we come to a close this morning, I want to, I want to offer something again that uh, was taught to our youth on our mission trip during our training time. Uh, They're they teaching our youth how to uh, share their 15-second testimony. We, we, because of what God has done in our lives, we, we all have stories. And there's a question, who, who's writing our story? Um, there was a time in my life when I was insecure and seeking to to earn my own way and so I was using performance to mask my insecurities to try to to ease the anxieties that I felt insecurity about myself my identity I thought I had to earn it I thought I had to work if I just worked hard enough then then I would amount to something but then then I encountered Jesus and his cross and I was just shocked. I was struck by what Jesus has done on my behalf for me in my place. And I am now convinced that I am accepted by God. I no longer have to earn my way, but he actually gives me rest in Christ. Do you have a story like that? I'd love to hear it. And so, so would our, our lost and wandering world as they're trying to find their own way. Think of the impact that the cross can make in their lives as it is made in our lives. Let us go out and love and reach the triangle and reach the nations with the gospel. Have a great week.